Now, yours was a professional family with lots of science in it. Yes, my father was uh, trained as a doctor and then ran a diagnostic pathology laboratory for most of his life until he became a professional administrator in his later years. And your mother a scientist? Yes, yeah, she, she was a more conventional scientist, PSC, PhD, and interested in zoology, but eventually did a PhD in uh, matters relating to the peripheral nerves of patients with diabetes. And what about your mother? Did her work impinge at all? Yeah, I got much more practically involved in that because when she was doing her PhD, I was at high school at the time, and she used to bring her work home with her. Not fortunately the nerves, but the electron micrographs of the nerves. And I used to sit there and count the diameters of nerves for her because it was a sort of routine and technical thing to do. But at the same time, I was thinking, well, why is this being done and what are we learning by doing it? Going back when you were much younger, as young as you can remember, what sort of kid were you? A uh, curious one, I guess. Uh, I like to take things to bits, put them back together again. Well, usually, not manage to put them back together again. Player, you know, I was curious about the way the world worked. I can rem remember thinking that uh, uh, I would be involved in the practicalities of science somehow, even when I was five, six years old. So you actually came to Australia to go to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. The Walter and Eliza Hall Institute had a clinical research unit headed by Professor Ian Mackay that basically was a training ground for clinical immunologists. How did you look further at the virus in women? Well, what I wanted to do initially was just to understand how the immune system saw human papillomavirus infection because there was just nothing in the literature at all about that. There were a couple of papers and they were obviously wrong because they predated the time when it was realized there were lots of different human papillomaviruses. They, they were written in an, e an era when it was thought there was just one which caused warts. There are about 30, aren't there? Or oh, least? about 200 now. 200 now. And then a whole heap more that we really just don't know what to number them as because they haven't been sequenced. But uh, in those days it was thought there was about 30. And uh, So what, what I decided we should do is first of all to build up a set of reagents to actually look at the immune response to papillomavirus. Having gone to a couple of international papillomavirus meetings, it was clear that nobody apart from Margaret Stanley in Cambridge was really working on papillomavirus immunology at that time. So I met up, and, as I was wont to do in those days, in the bar with Margaret Stanley at a couple of papillomavirus meetings. And we, we talked through what was known and what wasn't known and sort of basically worked out what would be worth doing. So I got hold of some reagents from Lutz Gisman in Germany who was working on the mechanisms by which these viruses cause cancer and started to use those to explore how the immune system might see the virus. We did a lot of work in mice and some work in humans. I recruited Dr. Robert Tyndall from the UK and he helped make some monoclonal antibodies that were able to react against the viral proteins so we could start to find out what was happening. Nobody knew how long you got the virus for. Was it a quick infection that most people got rid of? How common was it? Nobody knew that either. And indeed, it wasn't really until the mid-90s that we developed the model that we now have, that these infections are extraordinarily common. Most people get them. Most people take a couple of years to get rid of them without knowing they've had them. And it's only a few people that get persisting infection and get into trouble. So I decided that we needed to get better reagents for working in humans rather than the mouse work that we'd been doing up to then, because mice really don't get papillomavirus infection. That sort of drove me to uh, do a sabbatical in Cambridge in 1989, because what I wanted to do was to learn enough molecular biology that I could start to make reagents by deliberately producing human cells transfected with these viruses. So I went to work with Martin Evans, who was working in those days on embryonal stem cells, for which he more recently got the Nobel Prize. The other thing, of course, that happened in Cambridge, and perhaps the most important thing that happened in Cambridge, was that I met the late Dr. Jan Zhu there. And he was a visitor from China. He was really good at, this, at working with gene cloning and gene expression. So if there was any gene cloning problem that I couldn't do, or indeed anybody else in the lab, in Lionel's lab, couldn't do, they went all, always to Jan, and Jan could do it. And he was interested in immunology and wanted to learn immunology, which I could help him with. And I wanted to learn molecular biology, which, of course, he was very good at, so that the two of us got on very well because we were exchanging ideas all the time. When did it occur to you both that a vaccine was possible? Well, we set out to build reagents to work on the immune response and perhaps also on a vaccine because I'd already been working on trying to get a vaccine to treat papillomavirus infection even before I came to Cambridge. Uh, but so what we wanted to do was actually to build the papillomavirus itself. We knew we couldn't grow it in the lab. 
you know, other people had tried and failed. And we pretty much thought we knew why, although we were actually, again, wrong about that. So what Jan set out to do and what I encouraged him to do was to actually try and make an infectious papillomavirus. And the, in due course, he did that. It took about three years. But uh, as part of that, we really wanted to make the shell of the virus. And we thought that would actually be quite hard, and it turned out to be harder than even we imagined. But we, he, Jan had this ability to express viral genes using vaccinia virus. And then Jan had the idea that if we put in the L2 protein at the same time as the L1 protein, maybe that would lead to better expression of L1 and it might form a virus-like particle. And all of that turned out to be true, and it did. And we eventually got this picture back sort of in March of 1991 of the virus-like particle, the skin of the virus. So anyway, he, he got this gene cloned and, uh, as I say, put it into vaccinia virus. And if it was his, his ability to do that that eventually led to the p potential for making a vaccine. Because if we'd used any of the other ways of doing things, if we'd, if we'd used another virus type, as I say, it would have been quicker. But uh, we wouldn't have had the right virus because we really needed 16. That was the tough one. And uh, when we got 16, we knew all the others would follow, and indeed they all did. And we did some of them, and other people did others of them. And basically, we got a collection of different viruses cloned. So that that all came together over the course of about a year after Jan came out to the lab. And then, basically, as they say, the rest is history. And then we handed it on to the companies and said, look, you know, if you're going to have a vaccine, this will be where it comes from. Cervical cancer is caused by a group of viruses, of these human papillomaviruses. The cancer itself uh, affects about half a million poop people every year worldwide, and half of them die. The infection is extraordinarily common. You've got one chance in three that you'll get it in your lifetime if you're sexually active. And uh, the vast majority of people have it, and they nev never know they've got it, and they uh, never even realize it's been there, and then they just get rid of it. Of course, during the time they've got it, they're infectious for other people, and they pass it on, which is why this is such a successful virus. Uh, on average, you have it for about two years, so that you get it, you've got it for two years, you don't know you've got it, you're infectious all the time during those two years, and then for most people, you just clear it, and you never know you've had it. But for 2% of people, they go on to get persisting infection, which can then lead to cancer. The ones who are going to take it need to take it when they're quite young, presumably, and the ones who've got the infection, by that time it's too late. Yeah, the vaccine can only prevent infection with human papillomavirus. It can't cure you if you've already got it. Uh, we recommend that the vaccine is given to 12-year-olds in this country, largely because people become sexually active, at least a significant number of them are from 14 onwards. And while it's true that you won't get the virus the first day you become sexually active, you don't know when you are going to get it. And once you've got it, the vaccine doesn't make any difference. So it's really important to get the vaccine before you become sexually active. Persuading people to take this vaccine is partly one of coming to terms with the fact that you're going to be sexually active sometime. And what about overseas? We've talked mainly about Australia, the effect in other countries. Australia has led the world, let's be quite honest, in rolling out this vaccine programme. We were very fortunate that our government chose early on to adopt a strategy of universal immunisation of young schoolgirls. And I think they should be given a big tick for doing that. How many of uh, Australia's young women are now vaccinated? Well, a year and a bit into the vaccine programme, about 80% of schoolgirls have received at least two of the three shots. Uh, obviously, we'd like to get that up to all three of them, but uh, the coverage has been remarkably good and it's been taken up very quickly as a vaccine. And what about work now? What about the prospects, really, of curing the disease, if you like, rather than preventing it in the first place? Well, our research work at the moment is focused in two areas. One is working out strategies for delivering the vaccine in the developing world, and the other one remains focused very heavily on developing immunotherapeutics to cure people already infected with the virus. Clearly out there at the moment there are 20 million women who are already infected with the virus who are the unlucky ones. They're the ones who are going to go on over the next 20 years to develop cancer. So it would be really nice to have something we could give to them in the way of a vaccine to prevent that from happening. Because we can't screen for cervical cancer in the developing world in the way that we do through the pap smear program in Australia.